This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Today's guest is an advocate for empathy. I'm joined by Michael Andrews, who's the author of The Influential Christian, Learning to Lead from the Heart. He shares examples of how the men who followed Jesus were empathetic, and that is a key piece to ministering to others. And you practice being empathetic, uh, Michael. You, um, it just seems like one of those things that should come naturally, but it should come, I mean, our hearts should naturally say we want to do it, but how do we learn to do it? That's a perfect question because uh, a lot of folks do uh, suggest that empathy is an innate trait, that mm -hmm. some people have it and some people don't. I don't believe that's true. I believe empathy is more like a virtue. It's the sort of thing that um, we can work on practices that move us into that direction. And not only is it like a virtue, it's almost like a, a, a discipline, a spiritual discipline, in that when we start to work in that direction, the Holy Spirit helps guide us mm -hmm. and work with us to make us more that way as well. So I think it is something that can be developed uh, by our own practice and by the help of the Holy Spirit yeah. uh, to make us more empathetic. Right. Well, one, one prerequisite you bring up in chapter four is, is being open to our in, our in our thinking, valuing the other person. I, I really like this quote that you had in there. Uh, you have uh, from, I think it's uh, Elena Aguilera. Ag Yep, Aguaria. Uh, the, 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 the quote is, uh, no one can learn from you if you, th if you think they suck. So <laughs> we, we really have to develop a value for that person, right? I mean, we have, to, we have to value all the people that we're communicating with. That's right. Yeah, influence they, they is about... They understand that if we don't. They'll sense yeah, it. Influence is, yeah, influence is about connecting with people. And, and in order to connect with people, we need to uh, listen and value and understand the other person. Otherwise, it's just a temporary kind of persuasion. So as we're listening, uh, what I mean, we're, we're, we're listening to the person, but what are we actively doing in our spirit as we're, as we're listening to this person and processing what they're telling us? I, I, think, I think what we're doing is showing that we care, that mm -hmm. uh, love is what drives us, um, and that we want to understand them for who they are and, and what they're doing, not not just about our own agenda, mm -hmm. but we care more than just about ourselves. And, and that really reaches people when, when the goal is to love and value people yeah. rather than just to pursue our own agenda. Um, a good example is in the Bible in Acts 17 where Paul uh, comes to a city of Berea and, and they are just really uh, predisposed to listen to what he has to say and to be receptive to what he's saying. And they are really... A, a good example for us of how we can be. Yeah. I think uh, uh, people understand that. I mean, listening isn't just keeping our mouth shut, posing our next response to this person, but it really is. Uh, I think people understand that if they're sharing from their heart and you're listening to it, you're receiving something valuable from them. You're receiving a, a, a part of who they are. And we should show yes. that and in, in, in that we appreciate the fact that they're, that they're, they're sharing part of, of, of themselves. Yes. And, and, and in that relationship, we begin to act like an apprentice to them. I talk a good deal in chapter four of my book about uh, becoming an apprentice rather than just a mentor. There's a lot of discussion about being mentors in our mm -hmm. culture, and that's important. Nobody really talks much about being an apprentice. And, and yet, in order to understand people and value them, really the position we need to be in is apprenticing to them to understand who they are and what they're about. Yeah, that, that would be, I mean, I've been a mentor. I am a mentor right now with, some, uh, with a young child. And uh, that, that, that is a different way of looking at it. We put ourselves in a different position. And uh, you mentioned two things that are needed to develop good listening skills. I have a tough time with, <laughs> I, I think, with the first of myself. Relinquishing control, temporarily suspending yeah. our own narrative, and then yeah. uh, respectfully protect each other's identity. Uh, number one is very difficult for me uh, at times to relinquish control. I'm a natural talker. Uh, my wife's a natural listener. And uh, uh, I, I've got I've to relinquish that control sometime and, and set aside my own narrative to hear what's, what uh, the other person is, is, is trying to share. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, our, our own narrative is important, but it gets in the way of us hearing the other person's narrative. And if we really want to connect, both narratives, ours and theirs, should be regarded as significant. And, and so that means that we need to kind of not, not put our narrative aside, 
but to just give it less importance while we understand what the other person is about so that we don't impose ourselves on them. Yeah, I, I think this, this day of social media, uh, it's, it's, it's like a free-for-all sometimes. You just get online and let your feelings fly. You say whatever you want. Uh, we're not required to listen. And you think all this has negatively affected, uh, uh, I won't say generally, but uh, a lot of people's ability to even listen because they're so used to just letting things fly on the Internet with, without any repercussions sometimes. Right. The, the model and the example that people see when they go to, to – uh, social media is that uh, listening is not uh, valued or important or it's just you know just putting out your own propositions and your own thoughts and your own feelings mm -hmm. are all that matters and, and the way to engage is to just to say is just to talk more loudly and, and yet and yet that doesn't really connect with people well let's talk about reflective engagement a little bit because one of the things that we, we need to reflect on and, and engage with is uh, it's a receptive engagement, being receptive to God. I mean, first yes. of all, if we want to be that influential Christian, we've, we've got to be receptive to how God's leading us. Yes. Yes, we need to listen to him even more than we listen to the <laughs> other people. Um, and so our listening skills, I think we begin to hone with other people and with God. What is, what is our prayer life like? And how does that reflect what our engagement with other people mm -hmm. is like? Well, we're, we're reflective and, and uh, with, with God. And how about community then? Uh, how, do we, how do we transcend? Uh, we, we go from God and we're listening to God and we're, we're in prayer. But now we're out in community and the, and the, 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 the exchange isn't exactly the same. How, we, how can we be reflective and engage in community then? You know, that becomes a real um, challenge for empathy because empathy is kind of a person-to-person -person kind of connection. It's harder to... Um, be empathetic with a group, although I think it's important. And so we need to listen to what groups have to say. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes there are individuals who are telling us what that group is saying. So we need to listen to them, particularly when that group is saying something different than our uh, home embedded group mm -hmm. is saying. So if there's some cultural difference between the groups, he, to hear what they are saying and to hear the lead voices. Yeah. So in this last part of the book, you, 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 you focus on, on three areas. One is that that reception, and then we, we, we receive it, we reflect on it, then we respond to it. How do those things, uh, how, would you, how would that play out in a conversation or in a relationship with a, a person that maybe you just met, they're, they're a new person at work, and you're trying to develop that, uh, that relationship? How do those three things play out? Right. Um, I, I think they rarely play out entirely in a single conversation, mm -hmm. a single dialogue. I think what we're setting up is a relationship that once we begin to value one another, then there's a relationship there in which we can begin to um, think together, uh, think critically together. And when I say critically, I don't mean negatively. I mean examining the things that are important to both of us, uh, not just to me, but to the other person as well. And so reflection is a matter of discovering what our assumptions are, what our opinions are, what our rules are, how we interpret all those things um, and what we find when we start to examine our assumptions together is that a lot of times, the, you know, people who think that we are, people with whom we think we are very different, sometimes we're not as different as we think we are. We really want kind of the same things. It's just that how we have gone about getting them or pursuing them isn't necessarily the same avenue. And therefore, we get friction with the other person because our choice of paths is different. But so when we explore our assumptions, we begin to understand why we're different or why we're the same. Yeah. And that really, I think, is what's missing in our polarized cultures, that we're not examining what, what lies belie beneath the things that we're saying. What if someone's a natural introvert? What are, what's the best way for them to even begin this process with, with open-ended questions, the kind of things that Christ did? Well, I... I think all of us need connection and friendships, people that, who, with whom we can reflect together, uh, introverts, extroverts, it, it really doesn't matter. Empathy is not about uh, being an extrovert. It's about caring about mm -hmm. people. And quite often, introverts care more than the extroverts do. So, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it, it varies quite a bit. So, um, I think we need to develop the kind of friendships where we can really, um, as Proverbs 27 says, Iron sharpens iron, mm -hmm. um, where we 
help each other with the difficult things that we're going through. And in order to do that, yeah. we need to value each other. Yeah. Well, in order to develop those relationships, those friendships, uh, there's some tough things in there. I mean, you got to be vulnerable. You got to be willing to forgive. You got to be willing to look at uh, let's let's build this relationship in a in a healthy way. Uh, there's, there's a there, there's I mean, it's not work. It should come naturally to us. But at the same time, there's some things that that might not be com comfortable for us. That's right. And it's the kind of work that really pays off better than anything else does. Because when we have those kinds of people in our lives, the people that we have influential relationships long term, there's there's really nothing more in our life that gives uh, meaning to our lives mm -hmm. more than those kinds of relationships. Uh, let's talk about response for just a minute. Uh, the relationship is developed and, and we're, we're working on those things. Uh, there, there's several ways we can respond uh, before and after, I mean, during and, and after those conversations. What, yes. what, how, how do we, how would you, you, you frame the, the responses of, of, of a new relationship? You, you know, we use the word um, response and some uh, similar derivative words in, in a number of ways. Uh, we talk about a response, which is usually just a reaction to some event. Mm -hmm. But we also talk about re being responsive, which means that we... Uh, have certain interpersonal and intercultural relationships that are important to us that we want to um, attend to. And then there's the term responsibility, yeah. which um, includes all the social aspects around us. And so the question we need to ask ourselves is how do the responses we make to other people communicate our responsibility to the other person mm -hmm. or to the or how, how are our responses commuting, communicating something about what we value? Yeah, and it, uh, I, think it was, I think it was Watchman Nee, there's a quote that says, I, I become responsible for and to the, the, the one I love. And yes. uh, uh, if it really is motivated out of, out of the love, out of our love for Christ to love people, as he's called us to do, love God and love your neighbor, uh, then we do have a, a responsibility that, that, that comes out of that relationship. Yes, and, and we find that uh, res being responsible to people is even more important than being responsible for people. Because mm -hmm. when we are responsible for people, we tend to kind of stand over them and do things for them. Right. But when we're responsible to people, we're more willing to work with them uh, side by side and do something mutually uh, constructed together. Well, they've, they've uh, in this conversation, in this, in this relationship, as we've gone through this, they've shared life with us. And we're yes. responsible for those, uh, those things we've learned about them. We're responsible to, to treasure those things and to treat them with, uh, with love and care. Right, right. And, and, and the New Testament has such a perfect example of that relationship in the Good Samaritan, Luke 10. Um, you know, what goes on there between the Samaritan and the, and, and the Jewish person who's been mm -hmm. wounded, realizing that the Samaritan is somebody who is despised by the yeah. Jews— and yet that, that interaction, that empathetic relationship can take place because the one, of the, one side decides to reach out and do something yeah. Um, beneficial. Yeah, what's, what's uh, uh, both sides of that teaching, uh, the Good Samaritan doing his, his thing, but the, uh, uh, the Jew receiving that from someone who's, who his, his, his people despise. It's tough yes. to receive something from somebody that you don't appreciate. Yes, yes. And that's why this whole process begins with valuing people. Yeah, valuing people. Well, Michael, thank you for being with us today. Again, the, the book is The Influential, Influential Christian, Learning to Lead from the Heart, and uh, it will get you thinking about how you relate and, and communicate with the people around you. After the break. Greg Steyer is founder of Dare to Share. It's a worldwide ministry that helps equip young people to engage others in discussions about the gospel. You may be surprised that Greg didn't grow up in a Christian family, but through one man sharing the gospel with his father would change the direction of his life. That's coming up next. Would you like to help expand the reach of Viewpoint with Bob Placey? Then sign in with your YouTube account and subscribe. Do the same on your favorite podcast app. By subscribing, rating, and sharing Viewpoint content, you will help this life-changing media show up on more search engines as popular and trending. If everyone watching right now would do that, Viewpoint would become more visible worldwide to online viewers in places that missionaries can't even reach. Thank you for helping us reach the world by sharing Viewpoint with Bob Placey.
Today we're joined by a man who isn't afraid to share the gospel with others. Greg Steyer is founder of Dare to Share. It's a worldwide ministry that helps equip young people to engage others in discussions about the gospel. You may be surprised that Greg didn't grow up in a Christian family, but through one man sharing the gospel with his father would change the direction of his life. Hey, that's, that's quite a, I mean, looking at you and then looking at the, the, the title of the book, I think, nah, you never went through any of that. You look, you look like you're in pretty good shape. You didn't put up a lot of street stuff. What, I mean, this, this book, I, I, I've read sections of it, just trying to get it on, on the internet. I don't have it right in here in front of me right now, but uh, uh, it, it is, uh, it's a tough way to be raised, and you don't think of Denver as the mean streets of America. Well, tell me about the yeah. early early childhood. Well, you know, every city's got a city, Bob. I mean, it, you know, it, there's inner city Columbus, there's inner city Lincoln, Nebraska, there's yeah. inner city New York, South Chicago. You got East St. Louis, and you got North Denver. In the seventies and sixties, it was uh, it was the highest crime area in Denver, and those streets were ruled at the time by a mafia family called the Small Domes. Mm -hmm. And the small dones nicknamed my uncles the crazy brothers. So <laughs> uh, my family was not organized crime. They were disorganized crime. And uh, they were violent. Three of my uncles were competitive bodybuilders. The fourth one um, was a bouncer at the toughest bar in Denver. The fifth one was a Golden Gloves boxer, judo champion, war hero. My mom was the only girl in the group, and they were all afraid of her. She, she used a baseball bat. And my family was extremely violent. Wow. And they lived for violence. They worked out for maximum, you know, power so they could, when they hit somebody, it rattled their ancestors. So it was a, it was a really <laughs> violent family. I was yeah, I, I, I read here one of these notes. Uh, says some, some memories are permanently seared into our childhood brains with a hot iron of adrenaline and fear. For five-year-old Greg, it was a memory of his ma walking back to the house after confronting his stepdad with a splintered, bloodied baseball bat in her hand. That's a memory that won't leave you. Well, yeah, I was five years old. I was playing on the front porch, and here comes Paul, one of the guys my mom had married who had left us. We had no idea where he was. Pulls up in a brand new car. I yelled inside, Mommy, Mommy, one of my daddies is here. And she looked out the window. She was doing the dishes, cigarette hanging out of her mouth, dropped a couple F-bombs, reached behind the door, grabbed the baseball bat, ran out, cigarette still in her mouth, shattered his front windshield, took out his headlights, <laughs> took off his side view mirror, started doing body damage, and just taunted him, get out of the car. And, you know, she's got five street fighting brothers that are afraid of her. She's not afraid of this dude. He gets out. He makes a tactical mistake. <laughs> and she lit him up. And I remember Bob thinking three things when she walked back up. One, I will never disobey my mommy again, <laughs> yeah. you know. Two, how did, that, how did that cigarette stay in her mouth the whole time? And three, why is my mom so mad? Yeah. And she had a – I found out years later she had a shame-fueled – rage that was always pent up and ready to explode and um well, did, she was a wild child did that 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 shame did that that emanate from her family background something that uh that she grew up with something that she did that she was still ashamed of where that where yeah. that that rage come from it came from a lot of things one of the things i think one of the biggest was uh <clears throat> when um in 1960 Five, she met a guy named Tony at a party. They partied. Mm -hmm. She got pregnant. He found out he was in the army. He got transferred. Uh, she got in her car, drove from Denver to Boston to have an illegal abortion. Uh, and um, she stayed with my uncle Tommy and Aunt Carol, who were believers. He was stationed uh, in Boston in the Navy. They actually talked her out of it over a couple months. And so she came back, uh, had that baby, and uh, I was that baby. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, she, every time she looked at me, uh, a lot of times, not every time, but a lot of times she looked at me, she had burst into tears because she was so, she felt so guilty for almost aborting me. And um, so there was a lot of shame and it wasn't just me, but a lot of stuff that yeah. she had done and mm -hmm. that she never thought God could forgive her for. So were, were you, you, are you an only child? Do you have siblings? I have an older brother. Okay. So Doug was seven years older than me. Oh, and, seven um, years older. So was yeah. it, was was he any influence in your life at all growing up? Yeah, well, he was my protector in the you know in our area. With again, we were, lived in the highest crime rate area of our city, and so he he protected me. But my brother, you know, what happened? I'll just kind of back it up because you mm -hmm. need to understand the big picture. My family's in this downward spiral, 
and a hillbilly preacher whose nickname, for whatever reason, was Yankee. <laughs> of course. Why not? Why not? Planted a church in the suburbs of Denver and on a dare from a guy named Bob Daly, who was a believer, who knew my family. My mm-hmm. family's last name was Matthias. And uh, he, he dared Yankee to share the gospel with my toughest uncle, my Uncle Jack. My Uncle Jack, you know, was a bodybuilder, was a street fighter. Uh, Lyle Alzado backed out of two arm wrestling matches with him because Whoa. My, my, if you remember that, Lyle Alzado. Yeah, I, I do. That's, yeah. What he was that? afraid of my Uncle Jack. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my Uncle Jack in and out of jail his whole life, one time for choking two cops unconscious at the same time who are trying to arrest him on assault charges. Very dangerous man. Yankee goes to his door, knocks on his door. Jack comes to the door, no shirt on, tats everywhere, two beer cans, one for drinking beer, one for spit and chew. Talk like this. He goes, what do you want? And Yankee said, I'm here on a dare from Bob Daly to tell you about Jesus. He goes, well, I don't know Jesus. I know Bob. I'll give you five minutes. Invites him in. He sits at the kitchen table. And Yankee explains the gospel, not religion, but that Jesus came for sinners, that salvation wasn't by being good, that we're all sinners headed to hell that Christ died in our place for our sin, that he rose from the dead, and that everyone who simply trusts in him has eternal life. And uh, Yankee asked my Uncle Jack, does that make sense? My Uncle Jack didn't know any better. He goes, hell yeah. That was a sinner's prayer was hell yeah. <laughs> he trusted in Jesus, and it began a domino effect yeah. in my whole family. That, I mean, that's did, was that an immediate turnaround, or did Yankee continue to disciple him, or did, did Jack just decide I'm going to be this Christian. I mean, how, how immediate was that? Well, it was immediate. I mean, he brought 250 people out to Yankees church in one month, 250. I mean, think about oh, that one wow. month, 250 That's bodybuilders, street church. fighters, gang members. My uncle Jack, once he got a hold of the good news is like, I got to tell everybody now he was still rough. Yeah. You know, he's in the book, unlikely fighter. There's a, there's a scene where he is in a sauna as a brand new believer. And when you're in a sauna, you know, you have no clothes on He's sharing Christ with another buck naked bodybuilder. And there's a third guy from a different religion who's trying to argue and interrupt my uncle Jack. And my uncle Jack doesn't know the rules about loving your enemies. He goes, Hey, you interrupt me again. I'm taking you out. He continues to share Christ. The guy interrupts again. Boom. He hits this guy. The guy fell down, looked up and goes, Jesus didn't go around hitting people like that. He goes, well, I ain't Jesus. I'm Jack. <laughs> and so it took a while for sanctification to kick in. Yeah. But Sanctification is a process, right? It's a process. Um, but, but, you know, he, man, it, I remember when he came to Christ, it jolted. It, it was a gospel tsunami uh, that hit yeah. his life and hit my family. What age were you when Jack first came to Christ when this started? I don't know, exactly remember. I think it was like four or five when Jack when I when Jack came to Christ. Now, when Jack uh, when Jack received Christ and he went to Yankee's church, did 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 he take you along at that point? I mean, is that how you made the connection with Yankee? So all this stuff is kind of happening, you know, within months or years of each other, and a few years, and I'm you know my life is being transformed in the process. So it it was a, it's a wild story, and um, but you know when you're a kid raised in it, it's. You know, you just it's think this life. is normal. Yeah, it's normal life. It's life. You, know? you see, you see the dominoes start to fall, and uh, yeah, uh, one after another. And, and Yankees Church had mentioned that uh, uh, eight hundred kids in a, in a yeah. church with an adult membership of three hundred. He really believed the fastest way to reach a city was through the young people, and he was right. The city of Arvada, which is a suburb in Denver, was shaken through one youth group that and that's when i i started going to yankees uh youth group when i was a you know young teenager and that's when i learned how to share my faith that's when i got a vision to to reach the lost that's when i learned how to preach that's when i i mean i mean all that stuff happened when i was a uh at yankees youth group because he believed in the power of the gospel and the potential of young people was he leading all that directly or do you have he have other other youth leaders involved in that that were (laughs) discipling people like yourself Oh, he had, he had, the leaders of the group were older teenagers that had been saved through the youth group that he had trained and equipped and mobilized. And uh, a lot so of just Latino, repli- Just replicating itself. Yeah, and a lot of Latinos from West Denver and North Denver, and uh, they, they were the my hands-on youth leaders that were training and equipping us. And the first person on my mind, Bob, to, to share Christ with mm-hmm. was my mom. 
Okay. So when I was trained and equipped, I went back when I was like 11 or 12 and started sharing Christ with my mom. My mom would be sitting there like, you don't know the things I've done wrong. And I knew them all because my grandma had told me yeah. everything. So she was, you know? she, was, she was kind of putting it off because she felt guilt, not because she, she didn't want Christ in her life, but it was, it was because she didn't, the shame, they, because she didn't the shame. think God loved her. Yeah, she yeah. just thought, I've done too many things wrong. And so finally, after three years of sharing Christ, 15, I walked into the kitchen. You kind of got to come at my family. I set her mom down. I go, hey, ma, I don't want you to go to hell. I'm tired of you living through this hell. I want you to listen to every word coming out of my mouth. And I didn't talk like that to my mom because I don't want to get slapped. <laughs> you didn't want to get hit with a baseball but bat. She, yeah, <laughs> she listened. And uh, she's smoking a cigarette. She goes, you mean to tell me? That Jesus died for all my sins? I go, yeah, she goes, she took a drag. She goes, you mean to tell me all I got to do is put my faith in Jesus and I'm saved for everything forgiven? Yeah. You're given eternal life. Get a new family, wow. family of God. She took a drag. She goes, I'm in. She put her faith in Christ while smoking a cigarette. And then I asked her, where are you going to go when you die? She goes, heaven, cigarettes and all. I go, ma, heaven's not smoking. <laughs> but yeah, you are going there. And the, the the last part of your book, you you, you deal, deal with your mother while she's in hospice. Do you want to share any of that? Yeah. I mean, that's that's a poignant yeah. story. Yeah. Oh, it was our, you know, I mean, the book is 22 chapters mm -hmm. long, Unlikely Fighter, 22 chapters long. The first 21 happened before I turned 16. Yeah. The last one happened 17 years ago while my mom's in hospice for 40 days and 40 nights. Oh. And so the family, you know, is all gathering, recounting stories of how our lives have been changed over the years and how much God had done. And so it's really kind of a catch up chapter mm -hmm. of, you know, the, the power of the gospel. And, uh, you know, I just encourage listeners, don't underestimate the gospel of Jesus Christ. We got a lot of stuff going on in this country, a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. The gospel changes everything 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 so don't underestimate that gospel message and don't give up on reaching that one last person god's putting on your heart well you've taken all of that and all that energy that came as, as in your childhood and you've you've developed it into a, into a ministry dare to share you started this back in the in what 1990 somewhere around there. yeah it's actually yes yeah, 30 30 uh, years old well you can, it can't be you're not that old yeah i am that old <laughs> i'm 56. wow uh, but uh, dare, to, dare to share. Tell me about that, because you really believe that, that uh, the gospel can be effectively taken to the world through teenagers. Yeah, I saw it modeled as a kid growing up in Yankee's church, you know, that what Yankee did to shake a city, we can do to shake, a, shake the world. Mm -hmm. uh, there's 300,000 Protestant churches in America. There's 5 million or so worldwide. And so we live to energize the church, to mobilize youth, to gospelize their world. And so we, we provide tools, resources, training, equipping, okay. we mobilize teams. Viewpoint is made possible by the support of viewers just like you. Make sure you follow us on YouTube and share these shows with your friends. Thanks for joining me. I'm Bob Placey.